compliment back. Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to Black Doctor Speak, a show that I wanted to call Ball Doctor Speak, but uh, I thought that would be uh, too risque, so we're going to call it Black Doctor Speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, again, I am Ellis Dean, a uh, Senior Project Manager for BlackDoctor.org, and once again, I am joined by the incomparable Dr. Michael Lenore. Good evening, Dr. Lenore. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing a lot trying to be incomparable. That's the first thing. You put a lot of pressure on on, on a person. But uh, thank you, Ellis, for all you do to get us together. Uh, today's program we're going is going, I think, to be interesting. We have um, one of the uh, uh, icons for the San Francisco Bay Area, Dr. Jeffrey Watson. Dr. Watson is an internist who practices in this area uh, and has been practicing this area for a long time. His father was a legendary internist here. And so I thought what we ought to talk about what it would be like, what's it like to practice general internal medicine uh, in the um, COVID, in COVID environment. I know that I've seen everything from the New York Times to the Atlantic Monthly saying that because of the COVID virus, people are going without some of the necessary uh, screening studies and uh, not being treated adequately um, for other conditions. And so many of the uh, America's medicine is been getting concerned about that. And I'm getting concerned for our people that we need to really kind of stick with some of the things we've been doing all along, in addition to dealing with the coronavirus. But uh, first, let's bring Dr. Watson in and let's talk a little bit about where we are with the coronavirus right now. Uh, I think the news of the week, you know, generally is what we start with. Um, everybody's concerned about the variants. Uh, last week, we were concerned about getting the uh, the in vaccinations out. Uh, I think they've solved that problem, except we don't have enough vaccinations. <laughs> so that the people who are wanted vaccinations are having trouble getting them. I heard someone say today that um, that they could do four times as many vaccinations if they had the vaccines. So that was what we were worried about last week. Then comes the news that these variants are pretty much taking over the process. And that has some meaning in a lot of different ways. That means that those of you who are not already um, infected or vaccinated are at least a couple times more likely to get infected if in fact um, these new viruses, variants take over. There is some kind of good news. It's not always clear to me whether or not the vaccines are as effective against the variants. But what I did here today, Jeff and, uh, and Ellis, was that there are companies are working now on one vaccine for the flu, for air, all coronaviruses. The flu mm -hmm. the variants and all of that is where the research is going. And so consequently, I think that um, that's one thing. I think everybody is concerned about the fact that we need at least 80% herd immunity. And, and there are some 25% of Americans say they're not going to take any of these vaccines. And uh, African Americans disproportionately say they're not going to take the vaccine, uh, even though I, what I hear from my patients is they're waiting to see Jeff. Uh, what's been your experience? Well, you know, um, when, when we had our current uh, or previous administration, that administration didn't tell the truth. Uh, as in every business, there's racism. And it brought people back to things like the Tuskegee study and uh, experimentation on African-Americans. And so many people thought that the rush of the development of this vaccine was a situation that did not allow it to have appropriate testing, studying, and so on. As a result, many African-Americans and other minorities felt like, okay, you may be experimenting on me. And you did that with the Tuskegee study, with other kinds of studies. And again, this is in part because of our previous administration, which did not 
focus on science. It focused on politics. It focused on other economic issues. But health is a state of spiritual, socioeconomic, psychological, and physical well-being. But we have to have the science. Um, so right there, many people felt that they were oppressed, that there was racism, that they weren't being uh, considered. We had um, uh, all of these issues coming up. And so as a result, they said, you know what? I think there's some poison in that vaccine. I think this is another attempt to take me out. So many said they didn't want to take it. Uh, as a result, I became a little bit concerned myself because I didn't know how this uh, process had, had proceeded. I contacted an African-American infectious disease specialist by the name of Dr. Mark Finch. And I had Dr. Mark Finch on my television show on the Health Beat Show. And I asked him straight, I said, you know, I'm gonna ask you what the patients are asking me. So please don't get upset. You know, I'm a scientist, I'm one of your colleagues, but is there some poison in that vaccine? Is there something in it that is going to affect African-Americans and other minorities in a different way that's going to eat, make us sick? Is there some uh, coronavirus in the vaccine? Why do they want to give it to some of the minorities first? So Dr. Finch did an excellent job talking about the research that had gone into it. A fair amount of African-Americans were in the, the clinical trials and he talked about the fact that the, the virus itself is a, is a circle. And when you see it on TV, there's all these little prongs. And the prongs are outside the circle. They're proteins. And these proteins are what they snipped off. These proteins are not the infectious part of the virus. It's the RNA that is in the nucleus of the virus. The RNA on the inside is what gives you the, the disease. They did not utilize the RNA, but they used these proteins. And from the proteins, they developed the vaccine without any live vaccine or even live virus or even dead virus. They just used these pieces of protein. And from that, they introduced those proteins, which do not cause sickness. And your body then develops immunity, the IgG, uh, antibody, which is the first antibody that comes up, and then the, excuse me, the IgM is the first one that comes up, and then the IgG later. He talked about it, and he said, you know, we have to realize that if we don't take this, we're already at high risk of diabetes, hypertension, congestive heart failure, prostate cancer, and all of these things make us more at risk of uh, developing a a deadly COVID virus response. And so since we make up 12% of the population, but 30% of the deaths as it relates to hypertension, congestive heart failure, cancers, that right there puts us in a higher risk amount. So yes, the patients were afraid. Uh, they were afraid because of the history. They were afraid of our current politics. And they were afraid that we were gonna be experimented upon. I think after we had a change in our political system, um, you know, we had the Affordable Health Care Act, Obamacare, but when we had this past four years, what did you call it? It was still the Affordable Health Care Act. Our, our president didn't come up with any new ideas. He tried to get rid of the old ideas. Dr. Finch, African-American infectious disease doctor, convinced me enough on the television show. And I finally said, if you take it, if you take the vaccine, I'll take the vaccine. So I, this is a picture of me taking the vaccine, the Oakland Post uh, in December. I took the- Show them that picture in the upper right hand corner there. You know, oh, yeah, there's Dr. Lenore up there. There's your boy up there, too. Yeah, yeah. In, the same, in the same paper. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and you all must know that Dr. Lenore is my mentor. He's the first one that got me on radio, TV, writing, doing all these things. So I'm following him. Uh, but anyway, I, I did write an article um, about this in this newspaper. 
And I quoted uh, the National Medical Association president, Dr. Leon McDougall, who stated that black people are 1.4 times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19, 4.7 times more likely to require hospitalization, and 2.8 times more likely to die than whites. So that's the issue. We, we know Hispanics are getting this a lot, but we're dying more. We have a worse outcome as we do with many diseases. So when you look at, and, and, and the other thing is I work at the hospital, uh, I work in intensive care, I take care of these patients and it's, it's a frightening sight. It really is a frightening sight. Uh, I took the vaccine because I didn't want to get sick. I don't want my kids to get sick, my wife, my family, my 99 year old mother to get sick. So I didn't want something to happen to me to spread it. They say that this vaccine may have a 95% chance of preventing the first COVID, but as Dr. Lenore brought up, there's these variances. We don't know what it's gonna do for the variances. So we just have to see. After I wrote this article and, and many people, other African-Americans came out, uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee took the vaccine. You had our vice president take the vaccine. Now I'm seeing the tide change a little bit more. People are saying, well, if you took it, you know, you were brave enough to take it, then I'm, I think I might consider it. Dr. Watson, which, uh, which vaccine did you take? Did you take the Pfizer or the Moderna? I took the Pfizer. I okay. took the Pfizer right when it came out. I let, I let all the other doctors in the hospital take it first. <laughs> you know, just to see if anything happened or the nurses. And it didn't seem, nobody told me that they had an anaphylactic reaction or asthma or a facial droop or anything. Uh, it, it, the first shot hurt my arm. I was sore. It was like I had a shot, shot of penicillin maybe, you know, those shots hurt. Uh, the second shot three weeks later didn't hurt at all. I didn't have any side effects, only just the arm being sore. Have any side effects. Can I add just one quick thing, some context in terms of, for, um, for African-American uh, opinions about the vaccine. Uh, at Black Doctor, we've done at least five surveys uh, of our audience regarding the opinion of the vaccine. Early uh, uh, As early as April of last year we, uh, was our first survey, and we had numbers showing as high as 91% of African-Americans saying they would not take the vaccine within the first year. But our most recent survey in January of this year, January of 2021, there that number was down to 27% of African-Americans saying that they would not take the vaccine. And so that shows a significant shift with regards to the attitudes of African-Americans about taking the vaccine. So what's more important, what's important now that the vaccines are being rolled out and we've got Johnson & Johnson potentially being uh, approved here shortly, what's more important now is to making sure that African-Americans that want to take the vaccine can actually get it. And that's mm -hmm. that's a kind of been mm -hmm. a push here. Black now, when, now, when did you get your first shot, uh, Jeff? I got my first shot December twenty second. So you like you just like jumped in quick. <laughs> I jumped in because I was in, I'm in the intensive care taking care of these people. <laughs> you jumped in. You jumped in. Here's, there. My, here, here's my card right here. You know they give you a card that shows that you take the first shot and then you take the second shot. So I got the second shot January 8th. So you made your decision pretty quick. I mean, <laughs> well, that, that, let me, let me, you helped me decide. No, let me give you your props on this issue because you're actually taking care of these people uh, in the hospital. What is it like being a doctor uh, taking care of these patients who have um, uh, serious coronavirus infections? We asked the nurses last week, what's it like as a doctor? You know, uh, I mean, I hate to use this word, but it's terrifying. It is terrifying because um, there, we're very limited in what resources we have. Uh, we have the uh, medication remdesivir. We have IV steroids. Um, we have the regular antibiotics to kill the super infection. You know, blood products, people end up on dialysis. They end up on the ventilator. And that's that's a, a really sad 
uh, situation when you see the patients have to get on the ventilator, then you have to prone them, turn them on their stomach because that helps the oxygenation better. Uh, and then some of them just don't get better. I've seen, I've seen more than I would like to pass away. It's terrifying. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I've had to intubate them. I've had to put the tube in and, you know, and I step back, you know, right now we do have this uh, bubble that you can put on your head. It looks like a space spaceman. And when I go in the uh, intensive care in the isolation rooms, I put that on and that has oxygen flowing into it. Uh, I, you know, I wear my mask all the time. It's, it's, it's pretty scary. And what's it like, what's it like dealing with the families? You know, people, some people, I have some patients that don't even believe that this disease is out there, that it's all political and it's all fake. And uh, so that's, yeah, mm -hmm. they wow. think it's a, a made up political thing. Uh, and, you know, they, they're putting out fake news. Uh, but the families who, who, uh, uh, they they see what's going on on TV and how many people have died and they're pretty frightened. Now now let me give you the flip side. Um, there's a lot of people who get it, including people in the NFL and basketball and uh, young people that it do it doesn't affect them very much. It affects them like a cold. So a younger person who's fairly healthy. Uh, doesn't have, you know, bad obesity, immune system disorder, things like that. A lot of them do just fine. You know, I know other health providers who who have it. At, at one of the hospitals that I work at, when only Tom Hanks could get the vaccine and they weren't, I mean, get the uh, test and they weren't testing everybody, which they do now, uh, they had a patient come in and she was a very heavy set patient. They put her in the room. They put a fan in the room so that it, it, it was during the summertime, uh, springtime. And that air blew out in the hall. Twenty seven nurses turned positive. Twenty seven nurses turned positive because they weren't paying attention to how rapidly this thing can spread. But none of those nurses died. They were all fairly young, fairly healthy. Uh, so there is a, a, a group that bounces back and does well in, you know, 10 to 14 days in quarantine and um, staying away from all the negative health things. They can get right back to life. And, and several of my patients who've come in the office, that's happened. We test every single day. Our special guest, Dr. Jeffrey Watson. He is an internist in the Bay Area. On the front lines, if you have questions, Dr. Watson, as we go along, uh, please don't hesitate to type them in the chat. Uh, and Mr. Mr. Dean will take um, some of those questions as we go along. Jeff, Jeff one of the things that, um, that uh, we're concerned about, and I think this is one of the reasons we wanted to have you on the program, as well as celebrating your survival, uh, is that, um, you know, while this is going on, people still sick. So let's start with the fact that why are we so much sicker than the rest of America? Well, that's a, that's a good question. You know, our, some of our good friends from the National Medical Association did a lot of research and we talked about what kinds of things happened to us all the way back in slavery. And uh, some, of, uh, some of the folks, they actually went backwards. They went to Jamaica, they went to the Virgin Islands, and they went back to Africa, and they looked at hypertension, they looked at diabetes, they looked at the effect of uh, changes. And one of the things, I mean, I mean there's several things that happened. Uh, sickle cell anemia is one of the great examples that in Sub-Saharan Africa, the amino acids in the red blood cell shifted such that it could protect the red blood cell from being penetrated by the Anopheles mosquito and giving uh, people malaria. Well, that was a process called genetic polymorphisms, genetic polymorphisms. Now, when we put 300 people on a ship and gave them a handful of water and a handful of mush and 
only 80 made it across and then had to work in the field, those individuals we found retained sodium more. They retained carbohydrates more. And as a result, the sodium retention raised the blood pressure. The carbohydrates uh, retention raised the weight. So now we find a situation where you're not working in the field, so you develop obesity, you develop hypertension. Add the social and psychological stress of the world to that. And that is a recipe for illness. So you, you find the genetic polymorphisms. You know, we, we think that all men were made equal and all women were made equal, but there are genetic changes that occur environmentally. And then now we find that they're genetic. And so those have had a result uh, affecting diabetes, so that's why we make up 30% of the diabetics, even though we're 12% of the population. We make up 30% of the hypertension, although we're only 12% of the population. And then what we're seeing every day now that we have these cell phones and these cameras, you see the trauma that we are exposed to. And, and that includes you and I. Well, you know? Yeah, no, no question about that. You know, but, but, you know, it reminds me of the old joke, you know, why are we in Chicago? I mean, and you know the joke I'm talking about where we ask with all the qualities we have, uh, you know, what, what's going on today? Why, why are we still uh, having some of the same problems? We, well, you and I have been talking about this together for probably over 30 years, talking about those things that African Americans could do in terms of trying to reduce their need for, um, medications for diabetes and hypertension, uh, yet I don't know uh, if we've even come full circle. Uh, we still have a bigger obesity problem. We still have people who, um, you know, get their blood pressure checked, don't watch the diet. Uh, what, what did we do wrong? What was, the, what was wrong with our messaging? Uh, I think, as Carter G. Woodson put it, it was the miseducation of the Negro. You know, way back we were miseducated. We were confused. We we were exposed to the Willie Lynch aspects that made us think that we weren't anything special. We were told that we weren't the builders of pyramids and the inventor of the stoplight and the invention of the blood transfusion. We weren't told that we were the people that invented these things. So as a result, there became a, a lower self-image and the lower self image, you know, you see young people now wearing t-shirts that say RIP, R-I-P, rest in peace. They don't think they're gonna live very long. They've been told, you know, in where, where we live here, certain areas of East Oakland and West Oakland, Caucasians who've moved in, they can walk down the street with their dog, but if we walk down the street, we're gonna get shot. So there's a, uh, a miseducation. We have to start to, love ourselves more we have to become more proud of ourselves and you know we we thought that when we had uh, president obama that helped us to really feel great and gave us a shot in the arm but it seems like there's some backlash to that now you know you got a whole lot of white yeah, four years came out. Out. <laughs> yeah four years worth of backlash and that was called trump that was, that was the backlash 2016. <laughs> 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 we got a lot of backlash, and so, but we have to be smart enough. We have to be smart enough, and we have to teach each other at a young age to respect ourselves and to respect each other and to love one another and to exercise and to try to be healthy. I don't know about you. I put on some weight since this COVID thing. I can't get out and exercise like I used to. So this is called, this is just another layer that's added some difficulty to it. But the bottom part of it is the psychological issue that we've got to love each other and be proud of ourselves and proud of each other. And then there is the physical issue. Uh, we can't go to church, so there's a spiritual issue. And my God, there's an economic issue. 
Okay, so health is a state of physical, psychological, socioeconomic, and spiritual. You see that all levels have been pierced at this point in time. We got to try to figure out a way to do something about that. Well, you know, you, you're on the front lines taking care of people. And we always talk about the impact of racism on health. Obviously, as an African-American doctor, uh, thrown into situations that are more integrated, both in medical school and in training and in practice. Um, can you, in your own mind, kind of quantify what role racism plays in the health of Black people? Well, it's it's at the root of it. And I think that if you try to pretend that it's not there, you're going to have a problem. You know, we've had a few black doctors in our community that were elevated and they got good jobs and good positions. And, you know, some of them that we're talking about, including myself. And um, you get up the ladder and everything. And then all the time you have people who are trying to set up a situation to take you out. And that's the same as uh, anything else. You know, it, it's like driving while black. Uh, 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 a white person drives by, they could speed. You drive by slow, maybe you got your hat on backwards, you're gonna get pulled over. And if you get pulled over, you might get a knee on your neck, you know? So these are the kinds of things and they happen at every level, they happen at a professional level. They happen in sports. Uh, and, you know, the taller you are, the harder you fall. So we always have to continue to look over our shoulder. Uh, racism, clearly, you know, I, I try to know what are the major tests and treatments for all the major diseases that I'll see because I might send you to a specialist and the specialist will say, no, you don't need that test. Might be a Caucasian specialist. You don't need that. Mm -mm, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to order it. I'm not going to do that. Well, I might have to go around them and find another way for them to get that test or that treatment. And it's, it's a subliminal. And if you ask that doctor, are you racist? They'll say, no, no, I'm not racist. I'm not. Well, then what, what is that? How do you even define that? The fact that you wouldn't do for this black man what you would do for this white man. Mm -hmm. What is it? Give me what term that is. Oh, I thought it was just cost containment and, you know, managed care and blah, blah, blah. Unconscious bias. That's the, yeah. term, that's the term that we throw around a lot. We've all, we've all seen that. We've all had a chance to, to be, experience that. We've seen it in our in our patients. We've seen it in our interaction with our colleagues. I mean, I remember once going to a, um, a meeting of a large uh, integrated. Well, it's not integrated. There's only three or four blacks in the group, uh, and they, the lecture was on how you treat different ethnic groups. And boy, they got so incensed, like it was. It certainly wasn't them. When you and I both know, having sent patients around, that the impact of racism is no different in medicine and no different for the black professional than it is for black people who are doing other things. One of the things that we're concerned about and one of the reasons, many reasons we want to have you on is are you seeing in your own practice because the coronavirus epidemic that people are neglecting other aspects of serious illnesses? Yes, um, I'm glad you asked that question because you know, when when things started to get pretty bad, we never closed our office. We never closed it down. We kept it open five days a week, you know, eight o'clock till eight at night, eight in the morning till eight at night. Uh, because of the risk of the transmission, a lot of healthcare providers started going to virtual visits. In other words, you could talk on the phone or you could talk on Zoom and, you know, the doctor would refill your medication, blah, blah, blah. But how, how do you check somebody's blood pressure when that happens? How do you know what their sugar's been doing? How do you know what their weight is? Can you really see if their ankles are swollen? Can you really see all the wounds and 
uh, see, hear them wheezing and uh, see the irregular heartbeat that they have. So as a result of that, um, I felt it was important to stay open. And for patients that wanted to come in, you know, we would see them. We did do some virtual visits, but we, we uh, got with the public health department and we put up screens in our office. We put up the sign six feet apart. We have a special entrance, a special exit. We take your temperature when you come in. We test people. So we try to do all those things. And I don't think, and I really mean this, I don't think there has been one person who was a patient who came here and got sick from someone else with the COVID-19. But I do think that there has been a shift in healthcare such that a lot of virtual visits have gone on. And as a result of the virtual visits, people, you know, they can't get out, so they become a little complacent. They eat more, they're nervous, they watch TV, the kids can't play and kids can't exercise like they would if they were playing football, basketball, track, any of these kinds of things. They can't go to the park. They've, they've got all those places closed down. They can't go swimming, all these kinds of things. So as a result, people put on weight. Uh, they're not sure what their blood pressure is unless a visiting nurse. You know, we are trying to get uh, home devices that will check people's blood pressure, their sugar, their oxygen levels. But, and that's kind of a new thing that's just been coming out in the past year or two. But the majority of people don't have those devices. So as a result, um, you don't get the same kind of, of clinical care that you would if you had a face-to-face -face situation. Uh, it, it, in, in some situations, you you know, mental health, you can do a little bit, you can do counseling and so on, but it sure is difficult to take somebody's blood pressure or deal with congestive heart failure or diabetes uh, when you can't really see the person, take their blood pressure, check their sugar and those kinds of things. But what do you say to people though, who have these chronic conditions? Uh, what do you say to them about what they should be doing, how they should be going about organizing their healthcare system to make sure that they get the visits and the treatment and intervention that they need? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, back in the day when my dad was practicing, the, the doctors would do house calls a lot. They'd go over to people's house and, and some of the doctors, they might visit 10, 12 people a day, but we don't we don't have the time for the doctors to do that. We have a limited amount of, of primary care providers, but we do have visiting nurses. And for those people that are chronically ill and can't really get out, I think that to have a visiting nurse to come and check your blood pressure and they can call the doctor and say, you know, this person has gained 20 pounds, their ankles are swollen, they can't lay down, they can't, they can't sleep. So that's, that's one thing in which I think the, the medical system and the patient can come together. Um, but I do think that patients are going to try to ha have to take it upon themselves to really look out after themselves a little bit more. They gotta watch their diet. They gotta keep their weight down. They gotta try not to drink too much, smoke too much. They gotta stay away from violence. Um, and they have to be thinking about that all the time. Because if you don't, it creeps up on people. Well, I think we're going to uh, uh, certainly thank you for joining us on this phase of our program. I mean, uh, obviously we're gonna have you back on a number of different occasions. We, we hope to start to have at some point a second opinion show where people can call in and get a second opinion for some of the problems they have. And we won't tell, we won't tell them, Jeff, um, what to do? We just tell them what we would do, you know. <laughs> so, right. but, uh, but I want to I want to introduce Dr. Watson to our audience because obviously he's a great deal of a very, great deal of uh, information and very well uh, respected. And so we hope that you will join us again. But we promise these people a little bit of allergy. So Jeff, we're going to move into that. And thank you for taking okay. the time. Thank you. All right, now, you know, um, one of the reasons I wanted to move into allergy, Mr. Dean, was that 
this is the time of year in the Bay Area when the allergy starts. Uh, you are probably a little bit behind us uh, in terms of uh, pollen because um, our trees have already started to pollinate. And yours start a little bit later in March or April. But if you have an allergy problem, especially a pollen allergy problem, and now is the time to start thinking about it. So I thought we should discuss a little bit about allergy. And for many of our audience who really don't even know me well enough to know anything about us, I am an allergist. There are probably less than 150 black allergists in the country. So many African American communities don't, don't have allergists and ultimately don't get uh, some of the advantages of uh, seeing a specialist who does this. So I thought we should talk a little bit about allergy talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, how it impacts people, why it impacts people. Start primarily with just an understanding of what the problem is and uh, maybe in our discussion we can get that through. And then maybe next week we'll talk a little bit about foods because that's what many people are interested in. So let's talk a little bit about allergy. Um, you know, uh, probably 20% of the American population has, um, uh, has allergy. Uh, and what people don't realize that allergy is a different thing. So maybe you got some questions about allergy. It's probably the best way for us to go about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Because, because it's always better to tell a story. Okay. I mean, well, I yeah. I, you know what? I grew up with allergies, right? So, but I didn't realize until um, later on in life that I, that it was an allergy. Um, so when I was growing up, I grew up in Florida and um, my, my, my parents would have me cut grass and I would go out there in the summertime, spring and summertime with the lawnmower and I would cut grass. And every time I came back inside from cutting the grass, I would be itching. I would be sneezing and wheezing and I'd have to take a shower and go lay down. And that, that was just one of those things from playing sports. Um, I always, you know, just knew that that uh, I would start itching or have some sort of wheezing or coughing or sneezing uh, reaction after I did those things, but never realized it was an allergy. And my mother, my parents never took me to see an allergist, never talked about it when I went to go get my checkups and shots. It, just, it was just something that I endured until I became an adult and realized, hey, wait a minute, this might be some sort of allergic reaction. And then I took some over-the-counter allergy medicine and it subsided. And so um, I kind of self-diagnosed and realized I have a, uh, an al allergy to grass and an allergy to uh, pollen, uh, particularly in, um, in Georgia, now where I live, because whenever I go back to Florida, I feel, you know, I guess because I grew up there, um, it's not as intense. But here in Georgia, because the, the, I didn't grow up in this around this pollen and, and, and things like that, it, it gets more intense here. So I, I always feel when allergy season is coming on, uh, when the pollen starts popping up, uh, I can feel it in my sinus uh, in, in, in area. Um, so that that's that's my real allergy story. Uh, I, I'm probably very similar to many other people out there to just kind of say, "Hey, they just endure it instead of going to see a doctor about an allergy because it, it feels uh, it doesn't feel like a reason to go see the doctor." To be honest with you, not being completely honest. Well, you know, you've been when I, when I, let me just tell you a story about how I got involved in allergy. Um, you know, uh, a lot of my relatives had asthma really bad asthma, and uh, I had uh, asthma as a young kid. Uh, and it just so happened I lived in, this, in a place where you actually did have an allergist, and so I went and got all those tests, and they made a few changes, and I got a little bit better. So then when I finished my training, you know, to be an allergist, you gotta either be an internist or a pediatrician. I uh, called my dad, I said, you know, dad, I'm finishing up my training in pediatrics, I wanna take an allergy. Um, uh, fellowship. Uh, and he told me, he said, you know, son, he said, you just don't want to work. He said, because uh, black people, uh, when they have that kind of problem, they either drink or go to church. He said, and that's, that's, the, that's the way it's handled. So, uh, but anyway, I pers persevered and went and got some training in allergy and found out that probably in many African-American communities, um, there is no ethic for allergy. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons I went into the specialty. 
Now, one of the things that is confusing to people is what does allergy mean? Well, allergy means that you as an individual make something. You make uh, an antibody or an immune response to certain things. And the reason that's important is because there are a lot of other similar symptoms that people have that have nothing to do with allergy. For instance, let's just take lactose intolerance. A lot of people feel that lactose intolerance uh, is a allergy problem. But lactose intolerance is not an allergy problem. You don't make anything. You just lack the enzyme that breaks down lactose and so consequently stays in the stomach and you get the kind of diarrhea and bloating that's associated with that. And so, uh, so allergy, you actually make something. And the good thing about it is if we can identify the things that you're making something too, we can um, we can make um, we can make we have a big intervention there. Uh, and there are a lot of diseases that people don't consider uh, as allergy diseases. Of course, asthma has an allergy component. Hay fever, nasal problems has an allergy component. Sometimes skin problems has an allergy component. So allergy is really a, a big deal uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of the kinds of symptoms that people have. And so that's one of the things that um, that drew me into this field. And I've always been um, been fortunate. Uh, there's only uh, one black allergist in Northern California, maybe two or three in Southern California. And most black communities don't have that many African-American allergists. So I thought we would discuss it a little bit now because now we're getting into pollen season. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, you don't need an allergist if you've got a pollen-related uh, problem because now you know exactly uh, what can happen uh, when you have uh, the same kinds of experience that you have. And so uh, that's one of the reasons I went into allergy. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that are confusing to people. Uh, one of the things is, how do we make the diagnosis of allergy? Okay. Everyone says, well, you do the skin test, you do the, sometimes the blood test. We make the diagnosis of allergy just simply from your history. And uh, your history is really Kind of critical in allergy, uh, the history is important because if you don't have an idea of what's causing your problem from allergy uh, from the history, uh, then a bunch of tests is not really going to help you. So that's those are one of those are some of the things that we have always been concerned about is that people have been depend too much on trying to get tests, whereas that you probably know right now what's causing your allergy mm -hmm. and, and 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 what have you done. I mean, in terms of trying to deal with it. Uh, so I think that's one of the things we want but to try to move people uh, into understanding uh, what, the, what the problems are. So in order to make the diagnosis, we pretty much have to ask about the allergens. There are only a few allergens that you have to be concerned about. They can be divided into pollen and non-pollen allergens. There's grasses, trees, and weeds are the pollen allergens, dust mold, and animal dander are the non-pollen allergens. Now, other things that, that make allergy worse, like triggers, like smoke, smog, changes in weather, that's not really allergy, those are mostly irritants. And the one thing that I really can tell you about it, and that we should talk about is animals, because mm -hmm. animals are another big cause of some of the allergies that we see. So uh, if you've got any questions about allergy of your own, or, People, let's get into it. I you, you just brought up the animals, and I was like, yeah, I realized I'm allergic to cats, and and um, that was one of those things that I found out the hard way. I went to go visit some relatives, and they had uh, some cats, and I literally woke up in the middle of the night, and my entire nostril passage had locked up. I could not breathe through my nose, and it, and I like I literally had to venture out at like three in the morning trying to find a. Um, a convenience store that was still open so I could buy some some allergy medicine so I could breathe. And, um, you know, so I, I think the good part of us having this program, and there's a question uh, from our YouTube uh, watcher, Katrina, so I'm gonna get that question asked of you. I think the good thing about us having this program is, you know, you don't, we don't want people to have to kind of fumble and, and, 
<laughs> and stumble their way into realizing what their allergies are. So we want to kind of get people to understand what the warning signs are, uh, what they should be looking for and be able to, and then so they can talk to their doctor, their, their, their medical provider and get it, you know, get some understanding ahead of time before you wake up in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, looking for some, some allergy relief. But, um, well, well, I, you know, I got a lot of good stories about animals. <laughs> I have, honestly, I have seen people so sick from animals that they were in the intensive care unit uh, two or three times a year, but I have never, ever seen anybody give up an animal. Mm, Once you get yeah. a cat or a dog, I don't understand. I don't understand it. Uh, um, Ellis, I don't understand it. I, I, there, there's a companionship and a camaraderie that comes with that. You know, yeah. I, I don't. I don't particularly like animals. I don't want them experimenting on, and I don't want them on coats. But I do not understand where you care more about your animal than you do about your cousin. To the point <laughs> where you are willing to go into the intensive care unit, you're willing to wheeze, sneeze, cough, or have skin problems uh, on a constant basis. But I have never, ever seen anybody give up an animal. One of the, <laughs> one of the good things. One of the good things about it, though is that if you insist on living with animals, almost everybody does, there are all kinds of things that we as allergists can do. One is to identify other things that you're reactive to and work on those because that makes means that that animal is not going to be such a big problem. Uh, and then there are ways in which you can work around an animal. Everybody who comes to see me with animals, well, I got a hyperallergenic animal. I got a non-allergic dog or a non-allergic cat. <laughs> or a non-allergic rabbit or a non-allergic horse. There's no such thing as a non-allergic dog. There's no such thing as a non-allergic cat. And so if you're going to live with that animal, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to work and live around it. Uh, and in that, that involves not only just putting the animal uh, certainly out of your bedroom. I mean, uh, you know, because once they establish territories, they're there for good. I used to make home visits when it was, when it was safe to make home visits. We don't make too many home visits now. And you talk to them about their animals and you go over there, that animal was sitting in the living room like it was in charge of the whole family. Uh, they're moving all over the house. And so consequently, those are things uh, that we can teach uh, as allergists. One of the things about allergy, uh, those of you who have it, don't have it seriously, is that many people don't believe there's much you can do about it, but just take a few medicines. But if you understand uh, you take some time and you think about the things that you are reactive to uh, and you move those things around, you can make a very big deal uh, in terms of trying to take care of some of the symptoms. You did have a question. Yeah, we got a question here from Katrina who's watching us on YouTube. Thank you for watching us, Katrina. And she is asking, is a constant runny nose a symptom of an allergy or something else? You know, uh, that's a very good question because uh, there are a lot of things that happen uh, as possibilities in a, in a nose that runs all the time. Uh, and uh, the, the thing about uh, allergy is that you usually can attach it to some set of circumstances. Uh, most of the people that we see, many of the people that we see have three, either three things. They either have allergy as a nasal congestion issue, they have sinus problems as a nasal congestion issue, or they have both. And the only way you can really tell is kind of ask yourself uh, what circumstances uh, are you in when your nose runs constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think that if you have a constant running nose, it always is a problem because it is a relationship between, if you think about it, uh, I, I believe in what they call the one airway, one disease problem. That means that if your nose is bothering you, that nose drips into your trachea, drips into your lung. And so consequently, if you have a constant runny nose, it can end up that you can have asthma, you can have sinus disease, uh, and the other things. So I think the only way to really tell is to, is to kind of sit down and figure out whether or not it's an environmental issue, whether it's a seasonal issue. And I think anybody with a constant runny nose should probably see an allergist because at least 20 to 30% of the time, in adults probably higher in children, you're going to find some allergy present. Okay, we've got another question uh, also coming from YouTube. Uh, this is always first class media. Um, does a plant-based diet reduce the risk of an allergic reaction? 
you know, a plant-based diet probably does not necessarily in and of itself reduce the risk of, um, of an allergy problem. Because in essence, what happens is that there are certain foods that are plant-based that cause a lot of allergy. Uh, wheat, you know, corn, if you consider these all plant-based, soy, uh, all those are uh, made, can be major allergens. And so consequently, just having a plant-based diet doesn't eliminate you from the possibility of having an allergy. Some of the most serious problems that I've seen have been from plant-based allergy. Uh, and certainly, uh, certainly, you know, uh, and if you consider soy and you consider uh, wheat, corn, those things, uh, we see a lot of patients who are uh, allergic to those things. We even see a lot of people allergic to beans and, uh, and, and fruits, uh, oranges, bananas, mango, uh, big allergen, uh, coconut, big allergen. These are all, and certainly nuts, maybe not main part, are usually part of most plant-based allergens, can cause the most serious types of mm -hmm. allergy. And so consequently, if you notice, but it's easy, easier than you think to make that decision. Because um, if you eat a certain thing and you have a certain problem every time you eat it, then, then, um, then that suggests an allergy is a possibility. And if in point of fact, the reactions are serious or constant, then uh, that's the time that you should insist on seeing an allergist, at least to identify those things that you might be reacting to. Now, there's no real shotgun. Uh, I see patients who come to me and say, I want to be tested. Everything there is to be tested for. Right. Well, there's no such thing as, as, as a shotgun approach to allergy. You really have to have some, do some of the detective work yourself, take a month, keep a journal, identify some things, and then you won't waste your time in an allergist's office looking for things that, that really don't exist. So here's a question from Kiva, uh, also from, from YouTube. So I, I guess our, our YouTube audience is really active tonight. Thank you all for joining us and, and watching. Um, she is asking, why are allergies worse at night? Is it because it takes time for your body to build those defenses you spoke of? Well, you know, the allergies themselves are not worse at night. Uh, well, let me just say why that might be true, though. Because the number one allergist, the allergen that we see is house dust. Now, house dust is this the conglomeration of a lot of things. But inside that house dust, and I don't want to describe it in too much detail, some people might not sleep tonight. There's a, <laughs> there's a house dust mite. And the mm -hmm. house dust mite is really what you're allergic to. And so almost all patients who have a consistent nasal problem that's allergic uh, is are, are allergic to house dust. And so consequently, at night is where you spend most of your time in your bedroom that's where you're exposed mostly to the dust. The other thing is that all the allergy symptoms, the nasal symptoms, the lung symptoms, the skin symptoms are always worse at night because you know you're in a recumbent position, uh, a lot of the mucus stuff falls into your trachea. And so sometimes those symptoms are worse simply on the basis of position. But the other thing is that house dust is the number one allergy. Now, mm -hmm. what I be careful out, uh, and I think LSU would appreciate this, is I can't tell somebody, you know, can't just go in there and say, you know, dust is your major problem. Because the first thing I'm going to hear, well, I've cleaned my house. <laughs> already, I, already I'm back up against the wall. I get my house is clean, but a house can be clean and not dust free. Right. So if you're in a situation where dust is a problem for you, then all of these things in your bedroom, knickknacks, trophies you won, all kinds of things that perfumes and then things that you keep in your bedroom, they all collect dust. So I want to be I want to be clear. You can have a dust allergy, but I, but but a room can be uh, a room can be uh, clean but not dust free. And so those of you who have constant nasal congestion, I think one of the first things you should do, if you even suspect remotely that allergy runs in your family, is to go out and get uh, some non-allergic uh, pillow and mattress covers. Get them from Target or Walmart. They're relatively cheap, and get rid of everything in your bedroom that you that you don't absolutely need to have in there, because any item in that bedroom has the capacity uh, to collect dust. 
So what about those uh, those devices that um, should we should somebody be changing their air filter in their home more often to try to reduce dust? Should they be should they buy a, a separate device to place in a room to reduce dust and allergens in the air? Or should they be using that um, that Navage uh, device that cleans cleans out the nasal passages and always talks about cleaning out your 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 basically your natural air filter, which is your nose? Are there any devices or anything that people could could buy to kind of assist in reducing the dust or other things that that causes allergies? Well, here's the thing. Now, I think any there are lots of things that you can do. Certainly, uh, uh, some of the HEPA filters, some of the uh, uh, filters are, are, are pretty good, but most of them, the particle size uh, that they deal with is too big. Uh, and so consequently, but a HEPA filter, uh, if you uh, can do it, but if you're really serious, you really have to put something in your heating system, like a uh, electric, electrostatic uh, precipitator to kind of ball up all of the house dust. So, so that, that's one thing. So I think that that certainly can help. Sometimes you can get some of the cleaning solutions that will also help. But what helps more than anything is removing uh, as many things as you can uh, from your bedroom. Uh, I think that 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 becomes the, the bigger thing. I hate to see people go out and invest in expensive kinds of filtration systems that are really not going to work as well as just taking a few items out of the bedroom. Uh, but uh, I think that's one of the things that we as allergists are reluctant. Uh, to recommend, but sometimes they do help. So uh, I'm going to just say this for the record. Uh, you cannot remove your spouse from the bedroom. Um, you cannot say that you are allergic to your spouse. That's not that's not an allergen, okay? It's the dust mites, not the person that's right. in the room with you. Just, just saying that for the record. I just want to make sure yeah. for the record that people don't start going home or, or looking at their spouse and saying, I'm allergic to you. That's a whole different conversation. Look, at some point, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> if, you, if, you can't, if you can't breathe, and you not half the night sneezing, snorting, and waking everybody up, then, uh, you know, it may be time to make separate bedrooms at least for a few minutes a night. We got to make that disclaimer, uh, Dr. Lodeau. We got to make that disclaimer because I, mm -hmm. I don't want uh, so people get kicked out their bed because they say they want to get down better. But, <laughs> and, and the snoring, man. Uh, you, uh, you oh, have to... that's a whole other show there. Uh, so I, we, I, we got I, one I know we're coming up on time. Is uh, Benadryl usage good for pollen allergies? You or know, uh, Benadryl is a good drug for pollen allergies because pollen allergies are related to are really what we call histamine mediated. Uh, and so Benadryl is a very good antihistamine. The problem with Benadryl is it makes you so drowsy that sometimes you can't function. That's why several years ago, pharmaceutical industry moved into those types of antihistamines that don't cross the blood-brain barrier. Drugs like cetirizine or Zyrtec or fexofenadine like Allegra or, um, or Claritin, which is loratadine. Those three drugs don't cross the blood-brain barrier and are 24-hour duration of action and will not make you sleep. Well, but Benadryl is a good drug to take at bedtime if in fact these other drugs are not working for 24 hours. Yes, and so, um, and just if you have, you know, I, I take sometimes I take Zyrtec D, um, but because of all of the uh, drug manufacturers and, and the, what's it, the Sudafed or Sudonephrine that's in the, that causes that decongesting kind of, uh, you have to go and show your ID now because of, of the uh, yes. crystal meth producers, and so it makes it harder to get it. But um, having that 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 extra that D on uh, whether it's uh, Sudaf, you know Sudafed or, or um, Zyrtec D or Claritin D, that does help in terms of clearing out the sinuses. And um, well, you know, uh, I, I think that what people should realize is that if you have just a pure sinus problem and not an allergy problem, you need to decongest. Mm -hmm. uh, because an antihistamine is not going to uh, is not going to help you. Uh, but I see we kind of run out of time. So what I'm going to do over the next few months is every every so often we're going to go back to the allergy issue. Yeah. Because the longer we go into the spring, the more people will suffer. And there are a lot of simple solutions in allergy that we can help you. At least I can save you maybe a copayment on the <laughs> visit. So I want to thank Dr. Watson for sharing his experience 
with us tonight. I think uh, seeing somebody on the front lines and hearing his experience, uh, understanding the fact that we as African Americans need to take better care of ourselves, to, to kind of fool this virus into thinking that uh, we're more, that we're really healthy, I think is very important. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dean, for as you usually putting this program together. But most of all, I'd like to thank you, those of you who took the time to listen to our program. We'll be here every week. We'll try to answer your questions. And if you've got topics that you want uh, us to uh, talk about and you want to ask questions about, uh, let us know. Uh, health is your biggest asset. So protect it.